Your Royal Highness, from wherever you are in the Commonwealth and the wider world today, welcome to London and our seventh CSC Global Leadership event. We're joined by CSC alumni from more than 20 countries around the world, including Australia, Bermuda, Canada, Ghana, India, Jamaica, Kenya, Malaysia, South Africa, Pakistan and the US. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening and thank you very much for joining us again today. My name is Peter Flavel and I'm the Vice Chair of CSC UK. We're enormously honoured to be joined by Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal in person here today, Directors of CSC UK and CSC Global Alumni as well as CSC alumni and some candidates also for the forthcoming Canadian conference in June and perhaps uh, pleasingly and very importantly the Royal Agricultural Society of the Commonwealth. It was with Her uh, Royal Highness's um, instigation to ask us to um, have more to do with the Royal Agricultural Society and as we've been talking with Sir Nico and other members there, it's clear that there is a good commonality of interest between both the CSC and the Royal Agricultural Society of the Commonwealth. I'd like to introduce you on the stage next to me, Sir Alan Parker, who is the chair of CSC UK, and Sir Nico Bacon, who is the chair of the RASC. We're delighted to have some young farmers from across the Commonwealth also with us today. Ananawa from Zambia, Nieng from Singapore and Leona Watson from Yukon in Canada. We're going to tackle one of the world's most critical issues, the future of food, looking at next generation farming, the challenges and the opportunities ahead. The awful Ukraine war against in Russia has highlighted how important our agricultural communities are to the world and how interlinked they are. I will shortly hand over to Sir Nico to lead the discussion with our young farmers before we turn over the discussion to you here at Coots in this room and online. For everyone online, please use the chat function to send through your questions or comments. Our production manager and CSC Global Alumni Executive Director John Thompson will curate those questions for me for us and uh, we will get to those Q&As um, after Sir Nico and interviewing our young farmers. Please welcome Sir Nico Bacon. Thank you. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, and I must say I'm delighted to be here for this study conference because the, it seems to make perfect sense for the Royal Agricultural Society of the Commonwealth to join forces every now and again with a study conference. And that will bring greater innovation benefits to agricultural communities around the world and around the Commonwealth. And that is what the whole thing, to my mind, is about. And I am, I have to say, excited about further collaboration that we can, we can no doubt, achieve in some years to come. Um, I think it's fundamental that grassroots knowledge, grassroots experience is really important and to my mind it's underestimated in communities and so often we get the top-down uh, political um, solution to problems when actually we should get it from the bottom up as it were. So enough from me um, and I would just like to introduce our three uh, next generation farmers from I suppose about the most extreme parts of the world as you can imagine. Um, it's 31 degrees and 70% 70, 70 humidity in Singapore. It is minus 17 and 64% humidity in the Yukon. And it's 20 degrees and 93% humidity in Zambia. So as you can see, there's, there's not one um, thing fits all. And that'll be the fascination. But I just wonder whether through all this, there will be a thread of commonality between all these three um, farmers up in, in, their various, in their various places. So we shall see. Um, right. Now, I, I think I'll start with the hottest 
Kenny, would you like to give two, two minutes about who you are and why you are and what, what you're bringing to the party? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And a very good morning, everyone. Uh, Red Highness, uh, it's been a while. Uh, good to see you. And the rest of the friends over here, I'm Kenny. I'm from Singapore. I'm a fourth generation horticulture farmer in Singapore itself. Um, and in the space of the last few years, I think COVID has really changed. And, you know, it's kind of disrupted the way how agriculture has actually well, it's going to be done, really. I mean, it has disrupted logistics, it has uh, disrupted farmers, it has disrupted food disruption in many ways. And Singapore as a city, uh, it's worth, right? Because we import 90% of our food. Uh, for those that have been to Singapore itself, you realize we're highly dependent on uh, imports to come to Singapore. And COVID has made us realize that not just that the food will be disrupted, the supply chain of farms will be disrupted. You know, egg farmers need chicken feeds, vegetable farmers need seeds, you know, they need fertilizers, and all this is part of the ecosystem. It's not just about eggs anymore, it's just not about food that you produce. So that makes Singapore realize that, you know, the need of us to be self-efficient, and that, during the COVID situation, has made us realize that we really need to ramp up our production. Uh, yes, we have been trying, and we have this... Uh, 2030 strategy, by 2030, we're trying to attain 30% of our nutritional needs, namely leafy vegetables, food fish, and eggs for the matter. So that's, that's the kind of situation that we have right here in Singapore, and I hope that during this session, I can share more with you what has happened to the cities. Feeding cities will never be the same, as I've shared with many people. Post-COVID is a new world order. Post-COVID is a new environment. It's not the same as before. We can't use the past to do the future. And we have to understand the demand of the current needs of the consumers today. And how can we help the farmers better? Can the farmers be better off? Can the farmers sell better? I think these are the questions that every one of us have today. So yeah, thank you. Kenny, thank you very much. And now we go to Leona. Um, a bit of personal, personal uh, um, stuff, please, Leona. Thank you, Your Royal Highness, friends and colleagues. Uh, it is a privilege to be joining my longtime RASC friends, Kenai and Anna. Uh, it's been a few years since we've seen each other. Um, and of course, joining the CSC UK. My name is Leona Watson, and my passion is agriculture. So much so that I pursued a northern remote life here in, here in the Yukon Territory up in Canada. Now, I was raised on a family farm, uh, both cattle and grain, alongside my four sisters. And as a post-secondary egg student, I was first introduced to the RASC in 2006 in Calgary. I then succeeded John Bennett as the next generation facilitator for numerous of years. Uh, during that time, I also became a Canadian Nuffield Scholar studying agricultural uh, succession planning. And, and then became an international keynote speaker, um, just trying to share, uh, share parts of my personal story um, of farm tragedy and encouraging those to plan for, for, the, for the future and enabling the next generation to take over the family farm. Um, so working together uh, with my global agricultural community and then I suppose about eight years ago, moved up to the Yukon where I became a wife, a mom, uh, a hunting outfitter, and as well as a homestead farmer. So taking that, that new land and putting it into production for the very first time um, in order to, I guess, contribute to the food supply in the, in the, in the fur, furthest Northern circumpolar uh, community. So as I mentioned, my passion is agriculture. I believe that food is life. And I was taught that where there is a will, there is a way. <laughs> so here I am trying to break down uh, barriers of the past um, in, in, in the way that things have been done in the past, uh, and just trying to forge new ways, new ways for the future. So I look forward to, to this morning's uh, conversations. Thank you very much. Now, from your background um, of, of snow, we go to Anna, uh, which is probably rain, Anna. 
Good morning, Your Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. Ladies and gentlemen, may I simply say all protocols observed. I'm more than grateful to stand here and to welcome you all to this important workshop uh, talking about the next generation of farming. I'm a granddaughter to a small scale farmer and a daughter to a small scale farmer. And I am a small scale farmer. In Zambia, about 80% of food basket is being provided by small scale farmers. So I can simply say I'm so proud to belong to a group of people who are feeding the nation. Um, I've, uh, I've done agriculture at certificate and diploma level. I'm busy with small scale farmers in my region, teaching them on agriculture production and productivity. I equally teach and demonstrate on the importance of preserving food and processing food for future use, because usually our food here, our food systems here, when it's rain season, our farmers grow a lot of food, and then when it's off season, uh, the food basket goes down. So really, my aim or my goal or my dream is to have food throughout the year. If we have to have a long lifespan for our farmers and for our children and for the next generation to come, uh, Zambia should be food and nutrition secure. I'm so happy to belong to this group of people who have got foresight uh, on the importance of food and the future generation. I'm happy to be uh, with you this afternoon or this morning. Thank you. Anna, thank you very much indeed. If we can go back to, to Kenny just to talk, just to, to um, fulfill some of what he was talking about and to talk about agriculture in cities, vertical farms. And, and one of the problems, presumably, Kenny, is, yeah. is the investment required for, for this. I think to put things in perspective, um, any food security, first of all, is very complex. Uh, you know, it involves environment, involves the whole ecosystem. But farmers at the end of the day, they are just like any other entrepreneurs that wants to have a successful and sustainable business. So to answer the question, sir, there's like uh, vertical farms. Is it something that we are focusing on? Yes, because land is scarce in Singapore, but we have limited land, but we are in both of space. Uh, so in the last couple of years, we get to see a lot of new development of farms coming on rooftops, indoor spaces, industrial spaces, offices, you name them. But at the end of the day, if you really look at the sustainability part of things, it's not sustainable at this present moment. Why? Due to various reasons. One, the ecosystem is not robust enough, i.e. that we, if we still import 90% of the food, all right, and you want the farmers to ramp up the demand, our question next as farmers is who's going to buy, all right? If you just keep on trading, would that be a better choice for farmers than growing? So these are all the real problems on the ground that we will ask ourselves. So as much as the production is critical in, in a small city state like Singapore or any cities itself, uh, it's very critical for us to understand the whole ecosystem that's needed for urban farming. So what I've seen personally, uh, as a farmer myself, in the last few years, we have a lot of new startup, very young startup, uh, all coming in with deep tech, high tech, food tech business in Singapore itself, trying to explore various ways of trying to grow food in Singapore. And the latest itself is cultured meat. You know, they, they literally grow meat in a lab base as well. So these are all the opportunities that is presented in front of us in the city. But ultimately, Sustainability doesn't just stop there. Production is one, but we have to take very close consideration in terms of demand because farmers at the end of the day really want demand. Proper demand, fair trade, pay them better so that they can attract better uh, workers to come to the farm. I think that's that's going to be the crux of the issue. Yeah. Kenny, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, Leona, something, now for something completely different in terms of questions. Um, because you're so rurally isolated, the community is, is a fundamental part of, 
of how how you can 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 farm and and, and, and with co-ops and so forth. Can you give us an idea of how that actually works? I think that farming, since since moving from Alberta, where agriculture is very intensive, and then and then relocating to the far north, where as very much like like Kenny, we import over ninety percent of our food in our remote community as well, and we're not not um, landlocked, but we have one highway. And that's that's the Alaska Highway that comes through the Yukon. And if anything were to happen to the highway, then the Yukon only has food for four days. And um, so, and, and and we've seen those challenging challenges this last summer as the highway there was a washout. So for two days, we couldn't get any trucks up to the Yukon um, with food. So the supply, I guess the, the biggest challenges up in the north is yes, access, access to inputs and access to um, what we need to to grow food. Um, but I'd say the the bigger challenges is like there's so much opportunity that the bigger challenges for us is the economic and the political challenge because I see it's access to land. And it's and it's the overregulation of uh, of our environment where farmers farmers don't have the right to farm. Um, so we're we're working on that because it, it it's it's not um, yeah pe people up here might think that there's lots of opportunity but they're not enabling it. Um, we're not supporting each other to to homestead more land or to 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 grow more foods and and be more diverse. We're 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 very innovative. Um, I think that we've seen a, a big growth in the last 10 years of what agriculture looks like in the north, and that's changed in uh, the circumpolar communities like Finland and Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, so we work together and we share we share our research and we share our um, our abilities to yeah to to become self-sufficient in, in food. There's only 40,000 people that live in the Yukon. So we're, we're not that many, we're not that many people. <laughs> um, but we, yeah, we definitely do, do what we can. And for myself, I farm uh, about 145 hectares and that's, and that's mainly in oats and forage. Um, Cause we, I have 30 horses to feed <laughs> 30 mountain horses. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun and, and and different, challenging, but plenty of opportunities. Yeah, no, thank you very much. You have one thing in common, I think, with, with Kenya, which is basically we import ninety percent of all your food. That's about as that's about as, uh, um, as far as any similarities go, I think, at the moment. Um, Anna, um, as you said, you, you, small scale farms is is something which we associate with 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 Zambia, but. Um, many of these are community led, and I just wonder how you feel with with the, the involvement of a family, how one can actually make it more commercial um, on a on a larger scale if that's if that's possible and if you if that's what you want. Thank you. Uh, Zambia sits on forty two million hectares of potential arable land forty two thousand. 42 million hectares of arable land, meaning uh, there is great potential for these small scale farmers to break through and become commercial farmers of tomorrow. But we have a couple of challenges that these farmers are facing in this present day. Uh, to mention but a few of the challenges that the small care farmers are facing are climate change, monocropping, inadequate mechanization, high cost of inputs, investment and financing, then farmers exploitation. These challenges that I have mentioned, they've put the small scale farmers in a vicious circle or in a cocoon where they cannot come out. Therefore, they would need our help as government workers, as a nation, or 
as donors, international donors. Uh, these challenges have seen the small scale farmers getting poorer and poorer because of uh, challenges of climate change. Climate change has brought about erosions. We have poor soils and the poor soils cannot support the growth of any meaningful crop. As a result, we have many low yields. The yields are coming down each year that comes. And then we have low income. So if a farmer has a low income, there's no way this particular farmer can dream of becoming a commercial farmer. Then we have a, a lot of pests and diseases which are coming out because of too, too much uh, drought or a lot of floods around the country. We see pests like four armyworms eating the, the green crops that farmers are growing. So this also reduces the, uh, the production or the products of the farmer. So the farmers cannot achieve their dream of becoming commercial farmers, despite Zambia having a lot of land, that land which can be used for production and productivity. As a result, the farmers are lacking income diversification. The monocropping, growing of staple food, which is maize year in, year out, has resulted into our farmers becoming poor. We would want to see uh, a group of small scale farmers growing cash crop and food crop so that they can improve in their livelihood. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. We'll come back to some of those points you've raised. Now this, this is a point really for Anna and Leona, which is um, as, as females in a predominantly male world of agriculture, you presumably face um, further challenges than, than the rest of us. Could you, could you, if that is true, could you give us an indication of um, how that might be uh, ameliorated? If I, Leona, shall I start with you? Thank you, Sir Nico. I think that um, I remember when I was younger um, and being the eldest of five girls on the farm that we were definitely looked at a bit differently and treated differently as we were running the family farm. Um, but that's that for me at least has changed in the last 10 years. I don't I don't really face any additional um, challenges or uh, or opinions, um, I think, in society because it's become more accepted. And um, yeah, I'm like I'm supported as a female farmer in my community, and and, and I feel lucky to to be so. Anna, what about you? Anna, how, do, how, how do you feel about being a female farmer? Anna, how, how do you feel about being a female farmer in predominantly a, a, a male industry? Uh, come again? How do you feel about being a female farmer in predominantly a, a, a male world of farming? It, it, it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> it feels great. You know, back home here in Zambia, I would safely say 65% uh, are female farmers. Mm -hmm. You know, being a female out here, it means you have to take care of your family. It, you need to take care of your neighbors or extended families. So being a female farmer, we put all what it takes to be a farmer. You sleep with the with the dream of achieving your goal in in production. So, uh, being a female farmer is just something super. We just need uh, external support from the government and uh, support from male farmers. 
I, I think that's, that, that's, that comment has gone down very well here. <laughs> uh, a bit of support from the males. I would, I would agree with that. Um, now, what, what's come out of um, Next Generation conferences over, over the years has been the requirement for education for um, agriculture amongst the general public, as well as education within the existing farming communities. Um, Kenny, do you, do, you, do you feel that that is still very much uh, relevant today? Yeah, I mean, definitely it's, it's important for the next generation to understand agriculture when they're younger. So in the last couple of years, um, even as young as uh, five years old to even seven years old, you, you get to learn about farming in school. So they will bring you to the farm, they'll tell you what do Singapore have. This, this is kind of a, a very good environment for people to really embrace agriculture. I think it's about time uh, that this is like, you know, every civilization in, in every city is always, the cornerstone has always been agriculture. Just that to build cities to what we are today, uh, agriculture has always been put as a sacrifice. So I think education is key, but education is also sometimes can be pretty lopsided because it all depends on the situation that the market has as well. Uh, and one of the biggest hurdles that I'm trying to let the future generation to understand is to, you know, don't get your answers from Google, talk to the farmers, you know, because Google will tell you what is the problem, but sometimes it doesn't tell you the real problems on the ground. So my, my goals are fortunate that I'm a farmer, so I give them the real problems when I see them talking about what the government is saying about, oh, Singapore has limited land, etc. I say, no, we have lots of land. All right, just that we are not prioritizing it to agriculture. So, so to, just to give them the balanced kind of information, because if not, as they grow up, they will tend to skew towards one direction and the real problems on the ground will never be resolved. And yep, as much as education is key, uh, real information has to be fed to them as well to balance off their thought process. I mean, we have very bright students in Singapore. Uh, many of them are really passionate about helping the farmers. I have a few students that came to me recently uh, wanting to come up with solutions to help farmers to sell more. And when you share with them about where do you get your information from? What do you think about the Singapore farming? It's like a standard kind of reply that they will get from the internet. And then you say, okay, but that's not really that true. You know, you need to do more. You need to do this. The pain points are like that. And I think that kind of ecosystem is really needed. Yeah, so that's, that's how I see that in terms of education in Singapore, or even in the cities around the world. I must say, the same applies in the UK. Farmers aren't the best sometimes communicators, um, but certainly it's, it's, it's an issue that we face very much so in the, in the UK. Leona, do you, do you have the same problem in, in uh, the Yukon? I, I would say for sure. And I think that what we can do as, as agricultural advocates is share our story and, and, and share our passion. Because if we're passionate about doing what we do, and people will love that. Um, so we see a lot of farmers diversifying in Canada, especially in North America, that are that are processing their own their own cattle, their own crops, and and having that interaction right right with the consumer. Um, and it's great because they're getting the farmer story. And so just just last week, actually, I drove up the Alaska Highway and I picked up some some bison meat from a farmer in northern BC and and continued my way north so it's about a 17 hour drive uh, from the Yukon and, and and delivered that meat to about a dozen people that had purchased purchased some some meat online you know he's got a great website and he's the bison guy and uh yeah people want to support local so if we give them that that opportunity to to purchase local, I guess, if we have it available, then then they'll, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's grow that pride. Let's grow that camaraderie of uh, providing providing for ourselves and, and supporting ourselves. Last year, there was a comment online about um, how just somebody from, from the local city here said that, well, you're not a farmer if you're not producing food for people. And I'm like, well, I'm a farmer and I produce forage for animals. <laughs> and so there too, it's a perspective, um, lack of sharing our story, um, but a perspective challenge. And so you don't, you don't really 
grow your perspective until until you're until you open your eyes or share those stories. And those are the communication or, or those are the people that we need to communicate more with because those are the people that are influencing, like I said earlier, our politics. So the, the biggest challenges that I have here in the North are coming from the people who have say, who don't understand the industry or understand the potential of the sector um, and those sorts of things. So yeah, education is definitely um, at the forefront of, I mean, of any sector when we, when we go in and, and learn about anything, you know, so. Education in Zambia, again, takes on a different, a slightly different uh, nuance to, to the, uh, the other two. Uh, <clears throat> education is very important for any farming community. Um, as small scale farmers, uh, what we do is uh, whenever any seed campaign has developed a high yielding, uh, for example, uh, maize crop or vegetable crop, we go to the farmers and make what we call demonstration plots. We, we or farmers school. We start on land preparation, we plant together, and then we will monitor that crop until the harvest time. So teaching by seeing is very important out here. So if we need our farmers to adopt any technology or any high yielding uh, crop, we take the education to their doorsteps. A lot of farmers do not have access to television or platform to learn from. But as, as extension officers, we have that task to go to the farmers and teach them on the importance of agriculture by doing the demonstration together, harvesting together. So it's easier for the farmers to adopt new technologies and then I was thinking, maybe uh, <clears throat> as a nation, we should do, introduce agriculture science in our schools. Let the little children start learning on the importance of agriculture uh, from the early, uh, early stage. The Bible says, teach a child in the way it should grow, and in the end, it will not depart from it. So if we start teaching the children on the importance of agriculture at the early stage, they will appreciate the importance of agriculture as a backbone of food production. So really at any level, at any stage, education is very, very important. Education is, is a thread that runs through all parts of the agricultural community actually, wherever you are. Um, the final question um, really is that you're all three, you're leaders in your field from the, for, of the next generation. It's something that you have been involved with with the RASC um, during the conferences in your respective countries. And, and it, leaders need to train leaders. And I just wanted your, your quick thoughts on how you're going to train the next, the next generation of leaders. Um, Leona. Well, I think the last couple of years have been a challenge in, in obviously getting together in person, face to face, because that's really when the best stories are shared and, and, and you build off of each other. You build ideas and you and you share your backgrounds and experiences. Um, but I think in the meantime, yeah, like the RESC has done a really great job with the next generation program in, in facilitating lifelong friendships. And so Anna or Anna Kenny Kenny and I we we go way back, yeah. <laughs> and although we haven't spoken to each other in the last year or two, we pick up right from where we left off. So I think that it's important to yeah fac facilitate and foster that group um, of uh, of leaders of people who who I guess want to be optimists and want to want to see change in the future and, and um, yeah and just have that that support 
that support network, whether it be across the Commonwealth, because it's this, for as big as the world is, it is very quite small. Juliana, very much. Uh, Kenny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think for, for Singapore case or for my case itself, uh, Singapore is still a very young nation. We are only 57 years this year. So uh, compared to maybe all my friends here, um, we have a very huge interest of young farmers, actually, that uh, or potential farmers that they are keen to explore. They are all students. Uh, they wanted to go high tech. They want to go deep tech. Uh, and I think the role of us to to kind of inspire the future generation is going to be much more in terms of practicality rather than just aspiration. Because yes, innovation, research, et cetera, is going to help the agriculture sector in the long run. But I always tell a lot of people that food security is complex, but food is not. Farmers in general are just entrepreneurs. They are running a business. All right. You have to run it like a business. You have to sustain your business. You need to understand the dynamics of the economy. Uh, and you know, sometimes when a market like us in a city is so small, where our GDP for agriculture is only less than 1%, it's not going to be easy, right? Because farmers in the cities will tend to be a grower. Like I'm a fourth generation farmer. My great grandpa planted trees 112 years ago, but today itself, I don't plant trees anymore. So, so in a way that, you know, does that change the way? But it's COVID that let me found my purpose. During these three years of COVID, I realized that I'm a farmer after all, regardless of what we are doing. We can say that we have started to evolve our business to services. But as a fellow farmer, I ask myself, will you, if I'm not growing plants, what if my farmer, which is a vegetable farmer, a second gen, and the dad is telling her that when you take over the business itself, uh, please be a trader. Stop growing because it's tough, you know. And if everybody thinks like that in the world, who is going to grow food for us? That that sets me thinking really hard, you know. And how can we simplify the way people buy local? I, I've also stopped telling people to support local. I, I find that this support local thing is just getting too much because at the end of the day, action speaks for itself. So I started to tell people, well, support local to me is a given. Let's buy local. Let's put the money where our mouth is. Let's start buying local, feed the farmers, buy the produce at fair trade, continue to buy. And the better they are, the better the ecology will be, the better the whole environment, ecosystem will be. And farmers eventually, as entrepreneurs like you and I, we will think of ways to expand anyway. So, so I mean, that's, that's how I see the situation. Yeah, that's my point of view. Kenny, thank you very much indeed. And Anna, briefly, because you've already influenced government, you've had government ministers on your farm to show them actually how it works at grassroots level. So you, you, you are also training trainers, which is really encouraging. So Anna, you, just brief thoughts. Uh, I should thank technology because uh, we are able to talk, to e-talk, and it's easier for us as the train of trainers or lead farmers to form groups. Here in Zambia, we do form uh, groups where we uh, teach others on the on on whatever, uh, for example, uh, keeping of for broiler chickens. Uh, we teach them on the platform using the Facebook or using the WhatsApp group. Even if I, if, even if I can't travel for a long distance to go and teach the farmers or to teach other train of trainers, the technology allows me to share the knowledge that I have to them through the phones. Thank you, Anna, very much indeed. And, and thank you all three for being so wonderfully honest about the problems you face. Now I'm gonna hand back to, to, to Peter to uh, chair a, a question and answer session. So thank you very much. Um, the first question is uh, from Tracy in New Zealand. And Tracy, I didn't mention in the, num the number of countries that were listening in New Zealand. And my mother, who is a Kiwi, would be very unhappy. And Her Royal Highness uh, has just come back from New Zealand. And we hope, Tracy, that you haven't been too affected by uh, the extraordinary weather conditions that you guys have been experiencing, both in the North and the South Island. So your question is. How do we manage the transition of land use, land management and land ownership structures 
and processes in response to climate change while maintaining productivity and profitability. And perhaps, Kenny, are you in a position to talk about this transition of land use, land management and land ownership uh, in response to climate change? Well, I think this is a, a tough question when it comes to Singapore. For those who don't really understand Singapore, the farmers don't own the land, our government do. So we are at the mercy of our government. Uh, all the land belongs to them. Uh, they give us pretty short lease term, and that's the battle that we have been fighting year after year you know, to prolong. Because if we are really serious about food security, why the land can't be a permanent space for agriculture? But because as a small city state itself, where land is scarce, uh, a lot of times itself is very difficult for them to prioritize their usage. And farmers over the last 50 over years definitely has seen in Singapore that they have actually been pushed further and further away from the town or the city. The unfortunate thing about Singapore is that we do not have a hinterland. So right now we are at literally at a specific spot whereby whatever that we have done to our own land, we are now have to retake back and rethink, reimagine, and how do we put agriculture back into our own space? Because we have taken away all the agriculture land to build Singapore to what we are today. So I think that is going to be a huge challenge for farmers, really. So I can't really answer that question because climate change has changed a lot of things, right? Uh, government also realized that we can't be dependent on the soy-based vegetable farmers who are highly dependent on the weather. And Singapore itself, for those who have been to Singapore, we have two weathers, very wet or very dry. So we have no snow, we have no four seasons. But having said that, you know, farmers are now having a disillusion year calendar because the months that are supposed to be dry and, and warm, it rains. And then kind of months that are not supposed to rain, it just had drought. For like just basically no rain for a period of two weeks. And that created a lot of big kind of uh, problems to all the farmers that are especially in the soy-based industry. So I think climate change definitely have created a fair bit, but think about it from another perspective. So what do we do in the city? We start to push everybody indoors. So we started high-tech farming, et cetera, et cetera. But we are not, even though we are not at the mercy of climate change, but we are at the mercy of many, many other environments that is affecting farmers. The war, for example, have created a change in terms of disruption. The uh, utility bills itself for high-tech farmers in Singapore that usually occupies 30% of their costs have ramped up to 50%, eating up all their margins that they have, all right, literally in, in, the, in their whole business arena. So if you ask me, the climate change really has a big impact. And, and if you talk about land management in terms of transferring how that is done, unfortunately, I can't answer that from a Singapore perspective because the way we run it is very different from other countries. Yeah. Thanks, Kenny. Just, and while perhaps extending it a bit, um, I lived in Singapore for a bit, about 15 years. Um, now, the main shopping street is Orchard Road, and the road off it's Orange Grove Road. And I asked, well, why is it called Orchard Grove? Oh, Orchard Road and Orange Grove Road, because that's where Orange Groves used to be, but it's all high-rise now. So tell me, Kenny, yeah. is, is vertical farming, which you're famous for, is that something that is only relevant to places where land is limited? I don't think we have a choice, frankly. So if you really look at vertical farming as a farmer, is it a wrong thing to go into high productivity yield production? The answer is definitely a yes, that we need to go high tech. But as I've shared earlier itself, if you look at vertical farms in Singapore, many of us actually have to invest heavily in the infrastructure. And then you have to wait for the returns of investments at a much later stage. But the economy in terms of the environment itself is currently not robust. Remember what I shared earlier that we still import 90% of our food. So vertical farm to me, nobody would say no. So let's, let me put it in another context for everybody. Food security is complex, right? We need to solve many, many problems, uh, whether from the production to the demand to the sales. But at the end of the day, it's our farmers still need to be sustainable. So there's no wrong in high-tech farming. Every city will definitely go into that. I have friends currently from New York just came to me and they say that they have a very robust urban farmers in New York City right now. All the farmers are very excited. Then we have friends in Australia that's telling me that the cities, the youngsters are getting very excited going into farming as well. So you can see there's a growing interest. 
But I think the realism itself is that it takes the whole ecosystem where whichever cities they are in, are we ready as a city? Do the people really buy local? Are they spoiled for choice? Or do they still want choice? So I think that is the question we have to ask ourselves, that whether how can we actually do that? So right now, we have ramped up in terms of number of startups of high-tech farms in Singapore. Over the last two years, we have easily 30 to 40 high-tech farmers right now. But if you ask me, are they sustainable? I would say, let's wait and see. It's still a long way for them to really see results. Thanks, Kenny. Um, Leona, you mentioned that farmers don't have the right to, to farm. Um, and both yourself and Kenny have said that um, you're importing 90% of food. W what percentage of, could it be what, in the long term? What self-sufficiency do you think would be possible in your, in your area? I think in the Yukon, it might not be 100% probable of reaching 100% self-sufficiency. Um, but with that said, I mean, baby steps. If, if we work in the next five, 10 years to produce another 5%, another 10% um, and work our way, I guess, upwards and forwards, then then we'll get somewhere. And, and we are, I think in the last five years, there's been um, three new farmers that have diversified in offering, we can get farm fresh eggs uh, that are produced just, just in my neighbor here, um, indoor, indoor poultry um, operation, as well as we've, we've had a few hydroponic greenhousing um, initiatives start up. And, and I think that there's, there's greater potential if, if we're able to try new things. So looking at heritage breeds, uh, breeds for cattle and also heritage seeds. So I'm going to try a mixture um, of a new grass seed, a new forage seed here this spring and seeding some, some Anak alfalfa. And Anak alfalfa is a Siberian, Siberian variety um, that's known to grow well in the north, but in the Yukon alfalfa hasn't grown very well in the past because of the short growing season. But we definitely have an intense growing season of that of that three three months. So in the summer, we we pretty much get 24 hours of sunlight. And that's um yeah, it, it's it, it plants grow in a hurry if as long as they have a little bit of moisture. So for those farms that are able to set up an irrigation system um and and water their crops. So our our, our soils are about a class three. Uh not one or two, but um but but you work at it and like like Anna said uh, earlier, it's it's not it's not focusing on the monocropping. It's it's trying to enhance enhance your soils um so that they'll be better for you in the long run. So it's a work in progress and and we'll see where 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 we get to be in the next few years. Well thanks Leona. That question of heritage seeds is an interesting one. I know Kew Gardens here have a huge seed bank and they've been helping various countries in Africa um, with seeds that they've got in their bank here and getting them back to areas that have been um, uh, that have not been growing heritage crops into growing them. So um, Anna if I can just jumping back to the, the first question which was essentially about the impact of of climate change. Can you tell us what the impact of climate change um, is in Zambia and its impact on you as a, as a smaller farmer? Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the impact of climate change in Zambia uh, is high. Right now, uh, thousands of hectares are emerged in water through floods. Uh, this will result in hunger and starvation uh, in these coming months. So as Zambia, as a country, we, we are looking at um, at the tools which can help us reduce the impact of climate change. Uh, we are thinking of those farmers who are in lowland, they should be taken to highlands where even if we have a lot of floods in the country, those farmers who are 
producing their crops on highlands. They can have their crops saved for, for them in order to feed the nation. So, uh, the, the other impact of uh, climate change is uh, poor food security. You know, when the crop is washed away with the water, when the crop is attacked with pests, which are being brought in as a result of too much water, uh, there is usually hunger. So the results of climate change are that there's hunger, there's low income, and then there's food insecurity in the country. Thank you, uh, Anna. Now jumping to a completely different topic of, of succession, uh, family succession in, in farming, and I think all three of you uh, are multi-generational um, farmers. And the question is from John Henning, OBE. Does succession in farming primarily require behavioural or structural change? Perhaps if um, we can go to the owner first, given that I, we heard you were the eldest of five on the farm. Thanks for that. And that's a great question. I think that being proactive to any succession plan uh, takes a behavioural and a structural change. Uh, first and foremost, if the farm is not successful or viable, then it, it won't be successful or viable for the next generation. And so I think that in, in North America, uh, predominantly, it's, it's focusing on making, um, having, having a business plan and, and a farm. I go back to, you know, being proud of what we do. So having a farm that, that involves having communication, regular communication, sitting around the table and setting goals um, looking forward for that five, 10 year plan. And um, so making structural changes, but then also working together and, and, and uh, yeah, just having pride in the work that, that you do and working together um, and, and loving the work that you do, because we all want to be happy in, in the environment that we're, that we're in. Kenny, you said that your grandfather did uh, start it off, perhaps, who, I don't know if he was the first farmer in the family, how, do, how, do you, how does your family think about that? And before you answer, I'll just um, ask people in the room because I'm mindful I've been doing the online uh, questions. So if there are uh, questions in the room, we'll, I'll come back after, after this one. Kenny? Yeah. You know, interestingly, I'm not sure about the rest of you, but um, every farmer in Singapore itself wants to provide good education for the kids and get them out of the industry. So I, I'm one of them as well. My mom keep telling me, please don't be like your dad. You know, just get out, work for someone else. You know, so so he asked me about succession. Frankly, I don't think there is. The succession is to get out of the industry and, you know, you're on your own, dad and mom will just retire. Um, I think that is valid across many farmers around the world uh, that, you know, every parent's dream is to get them out. But... As I shared earlier, when I joined the industry itself, it was really not by force, by choice. Uh, it just happened that I can't find a job when I graduate <laughs> way back then because it was financial crisis in Singapore. And nobody tells me that once you join a family business, you are signing a life contract. You know, you can't back out. So, so I'm stuck in there. And then I started to realize that, wow, I mean, if I'm in there, what else can I do? It took me many years, uh, but thankfully... You know, to yeah. friendship that I built with local farmers and Commonwealth farmers as well, I, I started to realize that the community is real. And it took me so long to really find out the realization that after all, I'm a farmer after all. And I think that that really hits me very hard. And to answer your question as well in succession, I think future generation, whether regardless of farms or, or businesses, it has to be purpose-led. You have to really understand why you're doing what you're doing not just because your family have to do that. You know, do you believe that, you know, as a farmer itself, you're here to provide food for people? Uh, are you here to do, to bring nature closer to people in, in terms of my business? And we have to be very clear. If you are not clear, then this will take, it's just like a downward trend because people are just doing it for the sake of doing. Uh, and I prefer to have younger generation who have the heart, the passion, uh, the belief and the purpose to join the industry, to join the company, to grow the company forward, rather than to just pass it on uh, generation after generation. Yeah, so that's my personal take. Yeah, and, and maybe the technology aspect of that is perhaps the, 
more interesting one. I, I grew up on a farm. My grandfather was a farmer in South Australia, which is the driest state, the driest continent on the world. Uh, and he was very clear to me that he that I would not be a farmer. <laughs> um, but the the idea of of the youngsters you've been talking about, Kenny, uh, and thinking about technology and its role in in agriculture, I can see how that could be something um, that would be would in, would be interesting. Um, we have one question but, in the room here. If you could just say mm. um, where you're from, your name and where you're from. Christopher Edison Hello. Cogan yeah. from the Bristol Commonwealth Society. Hi. <clears throat> so I'm not a farmer, but I am hearing that um, it sounds like several poles, as it were, of arguments. So we're hearing about um, food security and a, a desire for people to um, buy local as well as support local. Um, but I think uh, that, and that's obviously you know desirable from many points of view. But it, it feels like there's a tension between those ideas and economies of scale and the global um, food markets. Mm. And uh, there's a sense that, and I think this is probably, I've actually got two questions, so if I do this one first, and this is actually probably best answered by Kenny, I suspect, and then my next question's probably by um, Anna and Leona. But uh, there seems to be a tension between um, uh, food security, to some extent, and buying local, and, and the industrial economies of scale side of, uh, agri of agribusiness. And I wonder if there's uh, space for a synthesis or a communication or some sort of balance between those competing interests that might actually result in better outcomes for everybody. So Kenny, did you, you get that? May, am I right to say that your question is about food security and the, the economy of scale, how these two can, can literally balance yeah, out? I think it was, right. more, it was more about that the local, buying local from local yes. producers is likely to be more of a niche activity. That's right. It's almost small scale on one okay. end of the spectrum versus large scale on the other end of the spectrum. And I, I, I understand that people here are mostly at the small end of the spectrum, but I'm, I'm thinking there must be some means or some synthesis, some, some platform by which uh, they could be, that, that could be improved. So maybe, maybe I can just try to, to share in, the, in this perspective uh, of things. 112 years ago, my great grandpa uses only organic fertilizers. Men created fertilizers, today organic vegetables is the way to go. Irony, right? Yeah. So what, I've, what I'm saying here is that, you know, food security is complex, but food is not. Farmers at the end of the day is really about sustainability. And my predicament of post-COVID is going to be a new world order, which I've shared earlier, that the whole production scale is going to deglobalize. It's going to affect the way people buy, buy food across the world. And people start to wondering, during COVID itself, my friends from overseas have been asking that their country itself is an agriculture country that exports, but they can't even feed their own people. It was said the government thinking, why is that possible? I'm a production country, and yet I can't feed my own people. What's going on? Disruption of logistics is going to disrupt the way how food is going to be distributed. And the younger generations in general will be looking at where the food comes from and their importance of climate change. All this will be extra factors that's going in. Yes, I agree the economy of scale is important when it comes to that. So a, a typical question that many people has put forth to me is that import food is cheaper than Singapore produced food. And in the past, I always wonder, is it true? Is that, are we fated? Is this our life? But actually at the end of the day, I have actually kind of enlightened them in this way. I say that actually, if you think about it, we are eating subsidized food because agriculture countries will subsidize their farmers. All right. And at the end of the day, they will subsidize the farmers in terms of grant, in terms of land, in terms of other stuff. And then they are able to produce better food and you're actually eating cheaper food. So if we eat some food from Australia, I need to thank the Australians for that because they are paying tax and they are the one that feed the farmers to make the food cheaper. So can you imagine that one day the government started to wake up and say, why am I feeding overseas people cheaper food? And I'll put the tax on export and then, then the food will go in. Or in another way, if mother nature have a tax, I think the world is a better world. I mean, that's, that's how I see it. So as much as you say that there's a balance between the big buying 
versus the small buying, if you put into comparison of the whole context of food production, is a whole ecosystem that is at play. All right. And ultimately, my question is, who is there to benefit? Will the farmers benefit, whether it's large scale or small scale? Or is it the middle people, the middle, the middle tax group, like you know, your traders, your supermarkets, etc., that is actually creaming off the, the margin from the farmers? Why can't the farmers be paid better? Why farmers must be poor? So, I mean, this is just questions that we have to ask ourselves, yeah. So it sounds like the answer is more like it's, it's and yeah. rather than or. I know you've got a second question, but I've, I've got, I'll just go to, to uh, Michael uh, Wright here, who's the Global Alumni Chair. Um, you have uh, a question, Michael? Thank you. Thank you. We know you're here. Um, yep. and Michael, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Michael has flown in from Saudi, uh, so very yeah. welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, so my question is probably to Anna, but, but can be directed to everybody. Um, clearly, climate change with science, with vertical farming and what have you, um, and Anna just listening to the challenges around the floods that you've had and obviously the floods in New Zealand, etc. cetera, um, what, what are governments or private enterprise doing about um, securing the food by, by going vertical? Is, is that something that's an active part of public policy? I don't know who and can take that, but maybe uh, start with Anna. I, I, I didn't get you clearly. So, so my question was, with, with climate change not going away and, uh -huh. uh, and, and the problems that you've highlighted with the floods, et cetera, and, and the famine that will result from that, um, what are they doing about taking government or private enterprise about taking farming indoors and going vertical so that um, food security can be, food can be secured? Okay. And, uh, as I had said, um, these farmers who are affected by floods, they're being displaced. They lose their homes, they lose their fields. The government is there to take the farmers to the upper land. And the government uh, of late, they've been giving uh, small scale farmers some grants and cash, cash social transfer, some monies to help them uh, grow certain crops which can be grown on upland or in lowland. For example, rice uh, is one step of food which is grown in Zambia. And where these waters go to, for example, I come from a province where they, where they grow rice. Uh, when there are floods, that's when the crop does well. So those who are in the floods and are growing the crops which are, which are suitable for, for the rice, which are suitable for the rains, for the floods, they are, they, they are not moved from the areas. But those who are growing crops which do not need too much water, they're taken upland. In Zambia, we have traditional land and the land on title, vast of it. So those who are displaced, they're given land. I don't know whether I've answered your question. So, um, okay. Is there anything else on that, uh, Anna or Kenny, want to touch on? Well, can I say yeah. on that one? I, I thought, Anna, you were very articulate on a big issue here. Um, in my family, my wife leads our farming. And uh, very active, she passionate on regenerative farming, passionate about a lot of the things I'm hearing from you, local buying, um, uh, and, and what is the future, next generation of it. Um, she's chairman of the Sustainable Food Trust. It, it's a big, passionate part of her life. And me, one step back, there's one or two things that I'm stunned by. One, the sheer degree of uh, innovation and creativity uh, being put into it at almost every level of the, as an industry. When you look at across it as an industry, there's very few industries I see that have got that much grassroots innovation, that many people coming into it, next generation being creative about it. But the other thing I'm stunned by is how the regulation is still really built around big businesses and, uh, and it's structured. And I think we had a question earlier about, about agribusiness and, and it, it makes it very, very difficult for a lot of what the new ones are coming up with, I think, much more progressive views, uh, Kenny, as you were talking about um, uh, going forward. 
But unless one's careful, the regulations are behind it. So I, I thought what was, I was hearing there was quite encouraging that uh, the government was actually understanding some of the challenges of climate change and, and encouraging small holders to be able to sustain themselves. Because uh, it is, as you say, sustainability, Kenny, to use your language, that is a key issue here. But the shift in regulation, I don't know. Um, I mean, we uh, I'm more focused on it in the UK and the British countryside. But I don't know if you can feel that in Singapore, in Yukon, in, in, in Zambia, whether that's a real shift. Because it's going to take system change and regulation as a big part of that. I don't know if you feel that happening. So you're asking a, a government supporting the change? Yes, because I thought Anna was very articulate. The government's are supporting that bit of climate change. But the bigger transition to new technologies, more innovative work, more local um, and regenerative, whether that's wh whether you see signs of that in, um, in your country. Well, Kenny, I, I guess Singapore through EDB, et cetera, quite famous around the world for supporting things that Singapore want to support. Are you getting government support? For, for agriculture? I think really have to thanks to COVID. I think COVID really changed uh, the world new order as I've shared. Uh, we have realized that we have money, but we can't eat money during COVID. You know, at the end of the day, if the disruptions of the ship, the planes and everything else is going to just be cut off, there'll be no food that's coming into Singapore. So the government have realized the threat that is real. And we are highly dependent on several countries, even though we diversify our baskets across. Uh, but as a Singapore city state that we are just a little island that have no natural resources, it's not going to be an easy maneuvering for us as well. We have to balance it very carefully as an open economy at the same time to be self-efficient. I think that's the reason why several years ago, our government started the 30-30 goal. At, by 2030, we achieved 30% of our nutritional needs. So we have only three core food right now that we are focusing on, which is leafy vegetables, eggs, and food fish. I will share with you some statistics to share with you where exactly we are, and we have another six more years to go. So in terms of leafy vegetables, we are currently at 4.3%, all right? And the government is going to ramp up 26% in terms of production, all right, by six years' time. Are we on track? We are almost there because the amount of high-tech farmers that has been invested heavily in Singapore are able to show potential. But at the end of the day, my question still lies, who are going to buy them? Because if you grow and no one buy, it's not sustainable for any farmer. In terms of the fish, we are at 7.8%. And in terms of our eggs, interestingly, we are already at 30%. So eggs itself, we are self-efficient in the sense of 30% go. But in the fish and the leafy vegetables, we still have a long way more to go. So that, if you ask whether the government is putting in all the support, yes, they do. They are supporting in terms of production, increase of productivity, and their food security strategy has been pretty robust to put different eggs at different baskets to ensure that we import from various sources and not to be highly dependent on one. But that comes with, of course, uh, some costs all right, for the farmers as well, because at the end of the day, the farmers will feel better off being a trader. All right, why should I continue growing food? Is there a need? Is there a one? Do we need to continue growing food where everyone wants cheap? So, so these are all hard questions we have to ask ourselves. Thanks, thanks, Kenny. Of course, um, Singapore is also highly dependent on water from Malaysia uh, as well to support agriculture. Um, and then, um, Leona, how how do you how do you feel about government support? Because well, I was going to ask Leona, because your picture you drew beautifully about local and and local demand, not just production, but genuine local demand. But that's quite difficult if you're carrying regulatory burdens, which are really designed for very big organizations in a different way. Are they adapting to that as fast as you're adapting to the new opportunities? In terms of, I think well, the thing is that, uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I was, I was going to bounce it because I thought Singapore, as you said, uh, you know, Peter was is a very special case, and they yeah, do adapt. They, and I was also wondering whether the Canadian or, and whether North America we were seeing adaption in that regular to say how do we support local? How do we because there's clearly demand. The question is whether there's a regular whether it's possible with a regulatory environment because it's a big part of it, like a bit like the land use piece. Leona, Leona, there's, hear you there's on definitely that? intent, 
um, there's definitely intent and the conversations have, have begun and there's, you know, strategy development and how do we, how do we promote this and educate people um, and go down that, that route. But I think the, the local, the local scene in the North is a lot bigger than just your immediate community. It's actually, um, I'd say medium scale processing. So, so a smaller scale processor of somebody producing a product right from farm to table is, is quickly growing to that medium scale. And, and we're offering our products to Alaska if possible. We're, we want to offer our products to um, the neighboring territory and to the northern communities in Alberta and BC. So it's this it's 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 a bigger community. It's not just your immediate uh, your immediate community. So there too, I think that that presents a lot of opportunity. But there is restraint in regulation, where in beef it has to be federally inspected, so it can't leave the territory. And why is it like that? Well, it's just because it's old old regulation from 50, 30 years ago that have that 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 has not changed. <laughs> and the process in doing so, well, that's the challenging part because you have the folks from from the city who don't have the perspective um, of being involved in the industry. Therefore they they really it's 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 a challenge. They're the ones that work in government and and I'd say yeah my biggest challenge in the in the in the Yukon is government because out of a population of forty thousand people, there's six thousand people that work for the government. <laughs> so uh, Leona, that's an interesting statistic. I heard uh, I heard something uh, thought the other day that every every new law enacted should have a sunset clause. So whether it's ten years or whatever, so that every ten years they okay. just so they don't go on forever. We did have one second question. <laughs> Yes, so um, the issue of regulation is exactly what my follow-up question was going to be yeah. because I, I, I am in favour of, um, of, of, of smaller local businesses, to some farmers to some extent, or completely. But I do see that as there is an increase in regulation, that particularly around environmental issues, larger businesses, the big businesses, are much more capable of lobbying, yeah. much more capable of having the scale to deal with the regulation and to affect what that regulation looks like than large numbers of um, small farmers are. And I thought Anna and Leona might well have a comment on that. Yeah, that's an interesting thought when I think of the farm lobby from where I come from in Australia that's incredibly strong. So perhaps, um, Anna, how, how are you thinking about that particular issue of, of smaller farmers not having um, the clout, I guess, or the, the power to affect government change? The small scale farmer not having what? Not having enough political power to affect government change and regulation. Do you uh, do you collectively get together as smaller farmers to lobby to try and change the rules in your favour? I think the small scale farmers do not have that muscle to to change the government. They are on the recipient side. The small scale farmers are on the recipient side, so it's very difficult for them to change any regulations in the government. Thank you for that. And one last question, it's sort of an extension, Leona, because that question was for you as well as to whether the smaller scale um, farmers have any capacity to affect the change that you're talking about. Well, there was another question for you from Joseph in Malawi. Um, and it's uh, it's around female farmers. And is it, do you have a role to play, and are you playing a role in terms of supporting other female farmers in in Canada? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, hello, Joseph. Oh, it's yeah. been a few years. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. um, oh gosh, I mean, yeah, supporting other female farmers definitely, hundred percent, and 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 as. Anna said earlier, it's it's we're we're the providers really <laughs> in a lot of instances. But um, but yeah, just just being involved, you know, as as much as we can. I think that my my time in my life has has taken a bit of a change because as we have our own families with young children, and and we try to spend as much time with them as possible. And and Mac and I, we we have the um, the opportunity 
to go full full remote and live out in in the mountains and and be completely off grid where where um yeah i get to share that experience with anybody that wants to come up to the yukon and and then spend that that family time that i guess going back to um being an advocate for for female farmers it's um yeah i i, I still have the privilege of speaking to uh female conferences across Canada uh the women's conference agricultural women's conferences where we yeah just get together and uh support each other they're again should support each other share our own stories and have a lot of fun so thanks very much for that question Joseph well thanks Lena. and we're and we're all very jealous of your background there some of us pick up photographs from the internet and put them as our our make-believe background on zoom but you've got a background there that <laughs> is real and looks just unbelievable. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm shortly going to ask uh, uh, Her Royal Highness, uh, the Princess Royal, to, to say Thank a few you, words and, uh, and address us. But before I do that, can I ask us all in the room to very much thank uh, our three agricultural advocates, I like that, uh, that term, Anna, Kenny and Leona. Thank you very much. Closing remarks oh, because Her Royal Highness did say that she wanted to ask a question about the importance of, of the shows. So we do just very quickly, um, perhaps um, starting um, uh, with you, Leona, the Royal, the, the Royal Agricultural Shows, the importance of them. Thank you. I think that it, yeah, the, the importance of the Royal Agri or the any show, um, any agricultural show remains um when i think of the calgary stampede and the heritage that 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 it instills to a instills in a to a national or sorry an international audience it's it's it's, it's what we have to be proud of and it's what we have to continue educating educating our our society and and influencing the society to want to be a part of um the agricultural grassroots community and so yeah, with with that, I thanks thanks everyone for for this opportunity to uh, to be involved in this fabulous event. It's wonderful to see some some uh, familiar faces again. Thank you, uh, Leona. I'm mindful of time. Uh, some closing remarks, Alan. It's not easy doing closing remarks. It's not easy doing thank yous um, because I always think you know I I I think it was utterly inspiring to have that next generation at it. And it does underline the excitement and importance of the organization. And I think great uh, for the RSC to be fielding a team like that. Um, I also always have the problem of offering thanks to Her Royal Highness. That's not an easy gig, I tell you, uh, because it is genuinely her inspiration, her thinking, her drive, which has absolutely lifted this and inspired, may I say, by her father who had at this inspired, genuine, no, no, extraordinary no, 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 thought. No, no, no. And part of that extraordinary thought, I hope we did absolutely bring to life today, which is let's look at big issues. And in the original thing, it was about industrialization, the impact of industrialization on the planet. Well, a lot of this is now the impact of globalization on the planet. So we're endlessly looking at the very big subjects that cut right across the Commonwealth and right across the world. And I'd absolutely thank you for your encouragement again, not just overall in keeping us moving and driving us and pushing us, hopefully, to drive it on, but actually in getting together with Sir Nico and his team and this inspiring leadership team. So I think it was an absolutely terrific idea, and I hope that really did work for you. I mean, we heard the subjects of food. It has become front and centre. It sort of epitomises, I think, the scale of change, and yet the fertility and excitement of what is possible in the world and you'll see at the bottom of the strap line on the slides we saw today, which is Commonwealth Leadership Matters. And I think we really do deeply believe that. And I would also thank all the folk who make events like this possible, Peter and the team at Coots, and I think everybody else who really does now, increasingly the alumni, absolutely. And I feel we're coming to an exciting time. We've had tremendous plans to now post-COVID, and I think, Kenny, you picked up exactly how different it is for us to be back in physical um, uh, meetings again. And I think, as you say, Your Royal Highness, how difficult that is to pick that up. The lovely thing we've had is an enormous excitement and enthusiasm for all the stakeholders around 
the Duke of Edinburgh's Cup study conferences to actually pick that up. So we're hoping to be back in 24 in physical presence, which I think will be exciting. And I do think, and I think there is a, you know, like the conversation today, it, it is the kindling of a larger bonfire. That is what we're trying to do. And, you know, I, I, I think it's an important metaphor. I stole it directly, I think, from the late Duke of Edinburgh's letter to the first Commonwealth Study Conferences all that time back. And I think that is absolutely what we're trying to do. So I'm very proud to be part of that long continuation of that. And I do believe I can't think of a time when we've got a more exciting role, a more important role, and bringing together what is the enormous potential to address these big uh, subjects and issues around the world through strengthening the Commonwealth, strengthening the links, and strengthening the leadership. So, um, and all the other supporters, thank you very, very much indeed. <laughs>